Hey, Pastor Jeremy here. Thank you so much for tuning in to what we hope is a great tool for you to utilize and to grow you in your walk with Jesus. Now, before we get started here, we want to invite you to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't done that. And then also hit that notification bell so that whenever we post stuff throughout the week, you'll get notification of it so you can use that resource to your benefit, but also you can share it with your friends and family as well. And then also we want to direct you to our website at fbcac.org, where you can find out more about our church family, uh, our different ministries, and then what God is doing and, and how he's using us to impact the kingdom here in Angels Camp, California. Now, here we go. We're about to get into the word of God proclaimed. Please feel free to leave a, a prayer request or, or a comment in the section below. Thank you guys so much for joining with us today. God bless you, and we love you. All right, well, good morning, everybody. It is uh, a blessing to be with you guys again and going through the Word of God. Um, and we are continuing our uh, sermon series on a commissioned vision, God's plan for the church. And we are in part three. And today our message is entitled, Visible Hands and Feet of Jesus. From the time after Jesus' death and his ascension, to the year 350 AD, Christianity saw an exponential growth in numbers of people coming to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. And we're going to see some, I'm going to show you guys some numbers here. Unfortunately, I don't have it on the screen, but uh, I were some numbers here, and we're going to see how fast and how far the church and Christianity grew. In 150 AD, there were 40,000 Christians. In just 150 years after the death and ascension of Jesus Christ, 40 million people came. I'm sorry, 40,000 people. 40,000 people, not jumping ahead of myself. 40,000 people came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In 300 AD, there were 1.2 million people who came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then just 50 short years after that, in the year 350 AD, there were 34 million Christians, people who came to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. In just such a short amount of time, how is this possible? How does this happen? Well, there's many different contributing factors to this, but the biggest one of them all was Christians acting out the love of Jesus by meeting people's material, relational, and spiritual needs. We have two examples of this from history in Roman letters and Roman writings. And one of them is of a very sad and unfortunate not so uncommon practice Romans used to have. When a husband and wife would have a baby girl, they would discard the baby girl by leaving her to die on a dung heap pile. This was their early form of abortion. And it was because males were more desirable in this culture than women were. They had a very sad outlook on this. But Christians, in hearing and seeing this horrific act, would climb these dung heap piles, rescue these baby girls, and then actually raise them as their own. And the Roman people and pagans have never seen this kind of act of love before. It blew their mind. And they were actually seeing Christians be the hands and feet of Jesus by rescuing these baby girls and raising them as their own. Another example we have in Roman writings is that Christians and the church were very active in taking care of the poor, in meeting their material, relational, and physical needs. Not only in their church and their own community, not only in their own or cultural settings, but they were also meeting the needs of the poor for those who were living a pagan lifestyle. 
And the pagan world had never seen this before. And once again, it blew their mind. They were seeing the tangible gospel by the Christians meeting the needs of the poor. And where they learned this from is the disciples who were teaching the words of Jesus, who were physically taught by Jesus. They walked with him for three years. And they saw Jesus meeting the needs of others as a tangible way of showing the gospel. And that's what we're going to be learning about today. We're going to be focusing on Jesus because we can't be the hands, we can't be the visible hands and feet of Jesus if we're not looking to him. If we don't know him, if we're not learning from him. So we're going to be looking at him today. And most of our text uh, we're going to be drawing from is in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8. If you guys want to go ahead and turn there, it'll also be on the screen, which says, Do not out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interest, but rather to the interest of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, and when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. So Paul here is he's laying groundwork to be bringing them into being the likeness of Jesus and meeting the material, relational, and spiritual needs of others. Because he first lays the groundwork by saying this. He's telling them, don't do anything out of selfish ambition. You need to consider others as more important than ourselves. To not look out for our own interests, but instead look to the interest of others. And that's what we first need to do if we are going to be the visible hands and feet of Jesus. Paul tells them, he's saying that because he wants to tell them, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. He's telling them, be an imitator of Jesus. Do as he did in meeting needs. And the first in your outline is when what Paul points out to you is that Jesus humbled himself and was a servant to others. Uh, Paul says this in our Philippians text in verses 6 through 7. It says, Who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. So Paul shows us that Jesus humbled himself in two ways. The first way that Jesus humbled himself was that he Jesus is God. He exists in the form of God. But he did not count being God as something uh, to consider as, as, as equality with, to be something to be exploited. Or as some of your guys' translation may say, uh, to grasp. And what this word, uh, exploited or grasped, literally means in the Greek is to forcibly hold on to. He didn't forcibly hold on to his divine nature as God. He emptied himself and assumed the form of, became in the likeness of humanity. And in doing that, he became a servant to others. Now, I, got, I don't want you guys to misunderstand me. When I'm, not, I'm not saying that Jesus was only man because he wasn't. The Bible teaches that Jesus was fully God and fully man. So, what do I mean by Jesus was humbled and he gave up his divinity? Well, where Jesus was once God, who did not get tired or weary, now in human likeness, becomes in our frailty where we get tired, we get weary. And Jesus being in human form was exactly that. He got tired. He got weary. We see this in Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 23, where Jesus is sleeping in a boat. And he's sleeping in amongst of a storm, 
like a raging storm where the disciples are worried about losing their life. I, for one, find it amazing that anybody could sleep through a storm because I certainly cannot. Um, but why is Jesus sleeping? He's sleeping because his body is tired and he needs that rest. Do you guys know what happens if the body doesn't get rest? The immune system starts to break down. We, if you do have, go so many days without getting rest, you quite literally go insane. And there's other physical aspects of not sleeping. Well, Jesus came into our frailty and needed to sleep. We see in uh, John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, where Jesus was worn out from traveling a long distance into, into Samaria. And the text actually says that he needed to sit down at the well because he was tired from his journey. Where Jesus was once God who did not need to eat food to sustain himself, to keep up his energy, now came in the likeness of man where he did need to eat food to sustain himself. Because if you don't, what happens? Your body starts to eat itself. You get weak. So And so Jesus came in all of our frailty in human flesh except for sin. And Jesus came in this likeness of humanity to be a servant, not to be served. Jesus, who is God, who is worthy of being served, came to serve and not to be served. And Jesus says this of himself in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. He says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, in Jesus being a servant, he served others by meeting their material, their relational, and their spiritual needs. And this is number two in your outline. And so we see uh, examples of this starting in Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 14. It says, when Jesus heard about it, he withdrew there by boat to a remote place to be alone. Where the crowds are where when the crowd heard this, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd, had compassion on them, and healed their sick. So I want to give you guys a little bit of some background context here. And so Jesus has just heard that his cousin John the Baptist has been beheaded. And he wants to be alone. He wants to be alone, I'm guessing, as we've seen in, in other gospel accounts, that Jesus wants to probably pray and talk to his heavenly father about what's going on. But he gets interrupted. He doesn't even get a chance to do this because a crowd that had been following him hears of where he is and follows him to where he wants to be alone. But I want you guys to notice what Jesus does here is. He sees, he saw a, a large crowd, had compassion on them, and healed their sick. You see, Jesus just doesn't see this crowd and notices like, huh, there's a huge crowd that followed me here. He doesn't just see them as to look past them. He intently sees this crowd. He intently sees that they have sick that are in need of healing. And in intentionally seeing this crowd, he has compassion on them. And out of this compassion, he heals their sick. He meets a material, or in this case also, a physical need. Uh, Mark gives us a little bit more to the story in a couple of different things that are actually going on here where, where um, Matthew kind of gives part of the account. Matthew, sorry, Matthew gives part of the account. Mark is going to go into a little bit of a, a deeper uh, part of the story. In Mark chapter 6, verse 34, we read, When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he began to teach them many things. So Jesus isn't just only seeing that they have a material or a physical need. He also sees that they have a spiritual need as well. 
Because look what it says here. It says he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus in, doesn't just intently see a group of people that has a needing to be healed of their sick. He also, also intently sees that these are a spiritually lost people who need to have their spiritual needs met. And so out of this compassion for seeing them, he begins to teach them. So Jesus is doing two things side by side here. He teaches them in word. And I can only imagine, and from other accounts of the Gospels, that he is probably preaching the Gospel. He's teaching the Word of God. He's teaching of heavenly things and of righteousness. And in this teaching, he tangibly shows the Gospel by meeting the needs of healing their sick. And he takes those two and he puts them together. He doesn't just preach the gospel. He doesn't just uh, meet their physical needs. He does both. He's acting out the word of the gospel in tangible form by meeting their needs. And we don't only just see Jesus meeting material and uh, spiritual needs. He also meets relational needs as well. And we see this in Mark chapter 1, verses 39 through 42, where it says, He went into, into all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Then a man with leprosy came to him and on his knees begged him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. So once again, we see Jesus is preaching. He's preaching in the synagogue. And not only is he preaching, but again, he's meeting people's needs. He's doing this by driving out demons. And a man with leprosy comes to Jesus in faith that he can heal him. And I'm going to bet he comes to him in this faith because he sees Jesus, he hears Jesus' words that he preaches, and then alongside that, he sees what he's doing by tangibly showing the gospel in a loving way, by meeting needs. And so he has that faith that I can come to him, I can be healed of this leprosy. This also causes this man to come in such actually a great way in faith, is that he actually approaches Jesus. As you see, people who had leprosy back in, back in biblical days couldn't be in without a certain distance of other people because they were considered unclean because of their disease. They would have to throw their hands up and go, unclean, unclean. So that way people knew to stay away from them. So this man kind of lived a life of solitude. He had to be excommunicated from the community. He was not allowed to be a part of it because of his disease. Although people with leprosy could go to synagogue, but under strict conditions. They had to be the first one in, and they had to have a net barrier around them. So they were set apart from other people. And then they had to be the last to leave. I kind of bet you each and every one of us knows what that feels like going through COVID. It kind of, kind of seems like a COVID situation here, doesn't it? But... This man has that faith from seeing Jesus, and he goes to him and says, If you are willing, you can make me clean. And I want you guys to note the phrasing that he uses here. He says, If you are willing, which in the literal translation of the Greek, he's actually saying, If you are desiring, you can make me clean. And look at Jesus' response to him. Moved with compassion. Are you guys kind of noticing a trend here? Jesus teaches and preaches, sees, has compassion, and out of that compassion meets needs. And in being moved with this compassion, Jesus reaches out his hand and he touches this leper to heal him. And this is very important to draw upon because Jesus, who is God, 
all-powerful, could just simply speak, and this man could be healed. Jesus just has to look at him, and this man could be healed. But instead, Jesus responds relationally to him by touching him to heal him. A man who is, for however long, has not known physical relationship or love like this due to his, le his leprosy. So Jesus meets his relational need. And look what Jesus says to him, of not just touching him, but he says, I am willing to be made clean. Jesus uses the same wording the man does. He says, I am desiring in the Greek. And he makes him clean. And I kind of want to shift gears here a little bit, but to the same point. So far, we've seen that Jesus has met with positive responses. We do see that in the Gospels, that people come to faith because of Jesus' preaching and his tangible showing of the Gospel by meeting the needs of others. But Jesus wasn't always met with positive responses. He was met with threats. He was rejected. If you guys remember the rich young ruler who came to him, he had a spiritual need, but he rejects Jesus because he likes his stuff. We see Jesus was betrayed by somebody he healed, where after he heals him on a Sabbath, the man goes and tells him, like, oh, is Jesus who healed me on the Sabbath? And the Pharisees begin to persecute him for that. Jesus, his life is threatened over and over again with being plot to kill against because of his preaching, because of his tangible acts of showing the gospel. So to your third, to the third point in your guys' outline, Jesus persevered in meeting the needs of others. And we see an example of this in Matthew chapter 12, verses 9 through 14, which says, Moving on from there, he entered the synagogue. There he saw a man who had a shriveled hand. And in order to accuse him, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He replied to them, Who among you, if he had a sheep that fell into a pit on the Sabbath, wouldn't take hold of it and lift it out? A person is worth far more than a sheep, so it is lawful to do what is good on the Sabbath. Then he told the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was restored as good as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might kill him. So again, we see Jesus in the synagogue. And uh, by other gospel accounts, Jesus is actually preaching. So again, we see him preaching. And he sees this man, intently sees him, as he always, as he always sees people, intently sees him, that he has a shriveled hand and he has a need. To be healed. But before Jesus can even heal this man, he is already met with opposition from spiritual leaders and the Pharisees. They are trying to entrap Jesus so they can accuse him, so they have a quote unquote excuse to kill him. So they challenge him with this question Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And in Jesus' response, he was in no way, shape, or form deterred from healing this man, from preaching the gospel and then showing the gospel in tangible by meeting this man's need. He didn't let it hold him back. He ended up healing this man, after all, to prove, to try to prove to the Pharisees of doing good, even on the Sabbath, and that it is not breaking the Sabbath. So even after healing this man, Jesus is going to be plotted against to be killed. So Jesus didn't always get met with a positive response. He had to persevere through all of this, and he continued to meet other people's needs. And this is ultimately going to cost Jesus his life. 
in your guys' uh, fourth part of the outline. Jesus was the ultimate servant. You see, where Jesus was being persecuted and met with hostility, this is where he is going to be the ultimate, be ultimately humble, where he's going to be the ultimate servant and meet the greatest need that every single living person has, and that is to be saved from our sins. Jesus would be led to a cross where he is going to die. And to finish our text in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 through 8, it says, Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. See, Jesus is going to show the greatest act of love that anyone could ever show. He is going to meet our biggest need that we have to save us from our sins. He is going to go through a very brutal and painful death. But see, Jesus didn't go to the cross right away, though. Jesus first was going to be flogged. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 26 says, Then he released Barabbas to them, and after having Jesus flogged, handed him over to be crucified. You see, if you guys have ever seen, have you guys ever seen Passion of the Christ? Yeah. You know that part where they take his clothes off and they chain him to that log? Right? That's what flogging is. That is probably in a movie scene, the closest depiction you're ever going to see, but still not give fully what Jesus went through. They're going to take a whip uh, known as a cat of nine tails that has leather, thick leather straps all, all around. And in these leather straps is bone and metal. So that way when they would strike Jesus with it, the bone and the metal would be caught in the flesh. And when they would pull back, it would rip the skin. Sorry, guys, I know I'm being a little gruesome, but I want to give you guys a detail of what Jesus went through for us. Painful, agonizing, and yet he still persevered. He still was going to go to that cross to meet the biggest need that we have to be saved from our sins. And if that wasn't bad enough, Jesus would still not quite go to the cross just yet. He's going to be beaten, mocked, spit on, and have a crown of thorns shoved on his head. We see this in Matthew chapter 27, verses 27 through 31. It says, Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the governor's residence and gathered the whole company around him. They stripped him and dressed him in a scarlet robe. They twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and placed the staff in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him, took the staff, and kept hitting him on the head. After they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. So if it wasn't bad enough that Jesus was just flogged, now they're going to mock Jesus who is God, who is king of kings. They're going to beat him with the stick that they are mocking him with. They're going to be blasphemous in bowing down to him. They're going to spit on his face. And Jesus endured this and persevered through this to be meet the biggest need that we have. It's to be saved from our sins. And still, Jesus would not quite go to the cross just yet. He would have to carry his cross from the place that he was condemned to die, tried and condemned to die, to the place where they would actually crucify him. Now, this is after the flogging. This is after the beatings. This is after all that he went through. He still has to carry his cross. And still, he persevered. Still, 
he went to go meet the biggest need that we have, and that is to be saved from our sins. Now, finally, at the place where Jesus is about to be crucified in John chapter 19, uh, verse 8. Sorry, Bradley, I think I skipped a verse. But it says, Therefore they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. So now Jesus is going to be crucified. He's going to have his hands stretched out, and he's going to have nails put through each of them. They're going to nail his feet to this cross. And he's going to be in such a position where he cannot breathe. And he has to lift himself up every time just to catch a breath, painfully and agonizingly, and then back down and repeat this motion for I think it was about six hours. And Jesus did this to meet the biggest need that we have. He met all the needs, material, relationally, and spiritually, on that cross. He paid the price of a debt that we cannot pay. He met the biggest need we had. But we know that the story doesn't end in tragedy, right? We know that Jesus was later put in a tomb for three days. And then he resurrected from the grave again, meeting the biggest need that we had. He defeated death. Where he defeated sin on the cross, he defeats death by resurrecting from the dead. So that way we can have a relationship with God. So we can have more than just our material needs met. We can have our spiritual needs met by salvation. So let's be imitators of Jesus in what he did. That's why Paul says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ. See, Jesus did nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. But he, in humility, considered others more important than himself, so much so that he would go through all of that and die on the cross for us. He counted us more important than himself by coming, by leaving his divinity, coming as man, someone who's worthy of being served, served others instead and served in the ultimate way by dying on the cross. So let's be imitators of Jesus and be like him and not only preach the gospel in word, but let's tangibly show the gospel to others in love and compassion by meeting their material, their relational, and their spiritual needs.